one of the most contentious and misunderstood Ellen G. White quotes used by Seventh-day Adventist Trinitarians to support the erroneous doctrine of the Trinity can be found in that classic book called The Desire of Ages. The quote in question can be found in chapter 73 entitled Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled and it states the following. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. What did she really mean when she was inspired to write that quote? What did she mean by the phrase, the third person of the Godhead? Just as the Bible interprets itself, so does the inspired writings of Ellen G. White. The same spirit that worked through the Bible writers is the very same spirit that inspired the writings of the spiritual prophecy. So with this in mind, we need to allow the spiritual prophecy to be its own interpreter. When dealing with that highly misunderstood quote in the desire of ages, the question we need to ask is this, who is this third person of the Godhead? Believe it or not, the answer to this question as you will soon see, will become absolutely clear as we allow the spiritual prophecy to be its very own interpreter. Let's begin by dissecting this quote very carefully. And it reads, Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. So this quote gives us some very important clues to who this third person could really be by stating the following, that this third person helps us to resist and overcome sin. The question that we need to ask ourselves then from the clues given in this quote is, who is this third person who can help us to overcome sin? Again, no need to guess or to speculate. Allowing the spiritual prophecy to be its own interpreter, let's see from Ellen G. White's own inspired writings on who is the only person who can help us to overcome sin. In that very same book, The Desire of Ages, and in that very same paragraph, where that third person of the Godhead quote is taken from, it reveals the following. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon his church. So, who is the person who helps us to overcome sin? That's correct, it is Christ. Before finding out why Ellen G. White stated that it is Christ and not another being who helps us to overcome sin, and to find out why she called Christ the third person of the Godhead, Let's take a look at some more spiritual prophecy quotes confirming that Christ is the only power 
but can help us to overcome sin and not another being. In the Youth Instructor, dated June the 29th, 1893, it states the following. There is no power in you apart from Christ, but it is your privilege to have Christ abiding in your heart by faith, and he can overcome sin in you when you cooperate with his efforts. Then, in A Desire of Ages, it quotes this, The only defense against evil is the indwelling of Christ, in the heart through faith in his righteousness. Unless we become vitally connected with God, we can never resist the unhallowed effects of self-love, self-indulgence and temptation to sin. Then, in the Review and Herald, dated February 10, 1891, it says the following, Jesus alone has power to save from sin, to free from the power of evil, and to doubt him who has laid down his life for us is to grieve and insult the Father. And in that classic book called Steps to Christ, it states the following about Christ being the only one who can save us from sin. And it says, Christ is the source of every right impulse. He is the only one that can implant in the heart enmity against sin. Every desire for truth and purity, every conviction of our own sinfulness is an evidence that His Spirit is moving upon our hearts. And finally, in that classic book called The Ministry of Healing, it states the following. There is but one power that can break the hold of evil from the hearts of men, and that is the power of God, who is the Father, in Jesus Christ. Only through the blood of the crucified one is their cleansing from sin. His grace alone can enable us to resist and subdue the tendencies of our fallen nature. So now that we have just read and confirmed that it is Christ alone who can help us to overcome sin, let's now discover how this can be done and why Ellen G. White called Christ the third person of the Godhead. What many Christians don't realize is that Christ has two natures. The scriptures declare this in the book of Philippians. Let's start in Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 6. And it reads, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And now, let's read verses 7 to 8. And it reads, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So, we see that in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, Christ had a form of God. Then, in verses 7 and 8, we see that Christ had a form of men or a man. In the spirit of prophecy, it tells us the following regarding the two natures of Christ. Please listen carefully to the following quotations. In Letters and Manuscripts, dated 1899, it states the following. Christ had two natures, the nature of a man 
and the nature of God. In him, divinity and humanity were combined. Upon his mediatorial work hangs the hope of the perishing world. No one but Christ has ever succeeded in living a perfect life in living a pure, spotless character. He exhibited a perfect humanity combined with deity, and by preserving each nature distinct, he has given to the world a representation of the character of God and the character of a perfect man. He shows us what God is and what man may become, godlike in character. Then, in manuscript releases, it states the following. His finite nature was pure and spotless, divine nature, but led him to say to Philip, He that have seen me have seen the Father also was not humanized. Neither was humanity deified by the blending or union of the two natures each retained its essential character and properties. Then, in that devotional book entitled Our Father Cares, it teaches us the following. Please listen carefully. The one here referred to as the Word is the Son of God, who was the commander in the heavenly courts, and who came to this world to open heavenly things to fallen human beings. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the word that was with God before the world was. In clothing his divinity with humanity, he became possessed of two natures, the divine and the human, and because of this, he was fully able to accomplish for the human race their complete redemption and their restoration to the privileges of the higher life. Then, in the Review and Herald dated July the 5th, 1887, it states the following about Christ's two natures. The Apostle would call our attention from ourselves to the author of our salvation. He presents before us his two natures, divine and human. Here is a description of the divine, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Now of the human. He was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. He voluntarily assumed human nature. He was God while upon earth, but he divested himself of the form of God, and in its stead took the form and fashion of a man. He laid aside his glory and majesty. He was God, but the glories of the form of God he for a while relinquished. Then, in the Signs of the Times dated May the 10th, 1899, it has this to say about Christ's two natures. But although Christ's divine glory was for a time veiled and eclipsed by his assuming humanity, yet he did not cease to be God when he became a man. The human did not take place of the divine, nor the divine of the human. This is the mystery of godliness. The two expressions, human and divine, were in Christ, closely and inseparably one, and yet they had a distinct individuality. Though Christ humbled himself to become man, the Godhead was still his own. And finally, in the Desire of Ages, it states the following about Christ's two natures. 
listen carefully to what it has to say. Looking upon him in his humiliation, as he walked a man among men, they had not understood the mystery of his incarnation, the draw character of his nature. And sadly, today, neither does the church understand the mystery of his incarnation, the dual character of his nature. To visualize the two natures of Christ, let's take a look at the following illustration. So you see you have one person with two natures, one human and one divine. It is this divine nature which is the third person of the Godhead according to the spirit of prophecy. So, in the Godhead, it is composed of two divine beings, the Father and the Son, with the Son being composed of two natures. Christ is the only being in the entire universe that has two natures, human and divine. So, you have as number one, God the Father. Then number two, you have Christ's human nature, which Christ inherited when he was incarnated as a man when he visited our world. And then number three, you have Christ's divine nature, which he inherited from his Father's nature from the beginning. This is the mystery of godliness, the human nature and the divine nature, as one in Christ Jesus. But it must be stressed that it is one person, but two natures. Christ clothed his divinity in humanity and there are things that his divine nature can do which his human nature cannot do. It is his divine nature which is invisible, which operates as his representative to us on this earth today, which is called the third person. This is clearly revealed in the following Spirit of Prophecy quotations, so please listen carefully. In the Review and Herald, dated January the 24th, 1893, it states the following, The same Jesus that walked with his disciples, that taught them upon the earth, that toiled and suffered in his human nature, is with us in his divine power. Then, in Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 21, dated 1906, it states the following. Please listen carefully. There is nothing else that can save us. Christ comes in his divine nature and here is every soul will be enlightened according to what you study, according to what you give the mind to feed upon. Then, in the Youth Instructor, dated July the 29th, 1897, it gives us some more information about Christ's divine nature. With his long human arm, the Son of God encircled the whole human family, while with his divine arm he grasped the throne of the infinite. He revealed his special grace and opened to our view the wonders of heavenly things. He imparted his own divine spirit to humanity, thus exalting humanity in the scale of moral worth with God. Then, in the desire of ages, it has this to say, 
While Jesus ministers in the sanctuary above, he is still by his spirit the minister of the church on earth. He is withdrawn from the eye of sense, but his parting promise is fulfilled. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. While he delegates his power to inferior ministers, his energizing presence is still with his church. Then, in the Review and Herald, dated April the 5th, 1906, it has this to say. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Christ is not here referring to his doctrine, but to his person, the divinity of his character. And finally, please listen carefully to this following quote about Christ's divine nature. In manuscript releases, it says the following. Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that he should leave them go to his Father and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. The Holy Spirit is himself, divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. He would represent himself as present in all places by his Holy Spirit as the omnipresent. Believe it or not, the scriptures also declare that it is Christ's divine nature or spirit that is given to us as a power to help us today. In Galatians chapter 4 verse 6, it states the following, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Then, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, it reads, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. When Sister White stated the third person of the Godhead, she was talking about the third dimension of the Godhead which was Christ's divine nature and not another being. It is Christ by his divine nature that helps us to overcome sin and not another being. It is Christ by his divine nature who is the Holy Spirit for us today and not another being. It is Christ by his divine nature that is with us today and this should bring us joy and much comfort as we recognize him as the comforter. In General Conference Bulletin dated April the 23rd 1901 it states the following Get ready is the word sounded in my ears Get ready, get ready he that is to come, will come, and will not tarry. Tell my people that unless they improve the sacred opportunities given them, unless they do the work I have given them, Satan will come upon them with the stealthy tread of a thief to deceive and to allure them. God wants us to be wide awake, but when he shall come, we shall be ready to say, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. He is coming to us by his Holy Spirit today. Let us recognize him now, then we shall recognize him when he comes in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory.
God calls upon you to get ready to meet him in peace.